Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Dustin Wax, I'm the uh, Executive Director of the Burlesque Hall of Fame, which is down on uh, East Fremont Street 6 in the Emergency Art Center. I hope you all come down at some point, take a look at our displays. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming tonight. I'd also like to thank the Las Vegas uh, Clark County Library District for partnering with us on this event. Uh, this is really exciting and this is uh, just an incredible room that we had no idea we were going to be in such a nice uh, place when we started talking about this. Um, I also want to just say uh, at the end of the event they have evaluation forms and some uh, information about the library. Uh, and they ask if you enjoyed the event, if you didn't enjoy the event, which is not very likely. Um, and if you just please pick up an evaluation form uh, and, and fill that out so they know uh, what kind of experience you have. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to talk about the history of burlesque here in Las Vegas, uh, sort of the history, the present, and the future of burlesque here in Las Vegas. Uh, I'm going to start by walking through uh, this presentation uh, with some pictures uh, and some of the history of burlesque, how burlesque came to be here, and how it's changed over the years. Uh, and then I'll introduce our panel um, and ask them some questions. Uh, at the end, we'll, we'll wrap up with the Q&A. Uh, if anyone has any questions for them, uh, that would be the time to ask them. Uh, and then uh, we have some, there's some material out in the uh, lobby, some photos and, and books and stuff uh, that you can buy and come bring back in here and have signed. Um, there's also material about the Last Call of Fame, uh, as well as about Cha Cha's uh, shows and, and her school, the Las Vegas Burlesque Studio. Um, so yeah, so let me go ahead and start uh, with the presentation and then we'll get to uh, figure out what they have to say. Uh, so, burlesque here in Las Vegas, as far as documented burlesque, I may have been the random person here off and on during the sort of war years and whatnot, but um, burlesque as part of modern Las Vegas starts with the Minskys. Uh, the Minskys were the big burlesque family, uh, the Minskys and the Ziegfeld uh, were the big burlesque families back east. Um, and burlesque was basically shut down in New York by Mayor LaGuardia. Uh, and the Minskys particularly felt the pressure. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, some of them, uh, they had theaters in some other cities, but, uh, but basically the Minskys moved out of the last in, in after the war, essentially. And um, Harold Minsky, who was the adopted son of Abe Minsky, who was one of the original Minsky brothers, uh, Harold came out in 1952 and started the show at the Dunes, which was the first topless review in town, uh, and the first of the sort of what would become the tradition of Las Vegas production shows. Um, oh, well, here I have that. <laughs> uh, there he is with, um, I'm sorry, my, the, my notes I printed way too small, so you, I may have to. Uh, that's uh, songwriter Sammy Khan uh, and showgirl Maureen Kelly. Um, and Minsky started the dunes, but he brings shows to the Silver Slipper, the uh, Silver Slipper, the Aladdin, and the Thunderbird over the next 20, 30 odd years. Uh, here's uh, Naja Karamuru uh, in one of uh, the shows of the dunes. Here's some of the comics. The the comics were a big part of, uh, had always been a big part of the last, and became a big part of the, the Minsky's Follies out here as well. Um, I don't know if, I can read that. It's uh, Dick Dana, uh, John Jensen, Eddie Lynch, who was the manager of the Follies there in the middle, Joe Rita and Tommy Raft, uh, Benny Figler and the Kasinski Follies. So this is sort of a sense of, uh, it gives you a taste of what the shows were like in the 50s. Um, this became pretty popular, and uh, very quickly other shows started popping up. The Sands had the Sigfeld Follies bringing in um, the Minsky Rival. Uh, name. Um, the uh, El Rancho started, uh, had Lily Singh, uh, or in resident uh, performer. Uh, this is one of their postcards. Uh, you see, she was so sort of closely associated with them that she became you know, associated with them as part of their postcards and their imagery. Um, <laughs> Lily Sincere built a, a career in Hollywood in Montreal before moving out here and her signature act was uh, one where she was lifting a golden cage over the audience uh, and then dropped clothes down. 
Uh, this was supposed to be super scandalous for the Las Vegas audience, which was, you know, a show would attract uh, married couples, and they thought the women were going to be so shocked. And she started getting letters from, uh, from women who had seen her show saying, how do you make those adorable bras and panties? <laughs> uh, and she realized that, that this is sort of where she got the idea that there was such a demand for these kind of sort of sexy lingerie uh, that she eventually started, uh, I have the, the name is just escaping me at the center, but she eventually started her own company selling lingerie called Lily St. Cyr Unmentionables. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's some pictures. There's uh, a picture of the uh, of the of that act of her in the gilded cage. Uh, Candy Barr was another popular performer here in the 50s. Uh, Candy Barr was kind of infamous as the star of what became she's sometimes called the first porn star. Uh, when she was 16, she was in a movie that became one of the most popular stag films uh, circulating in the day, uh, Smart Alec. Uh, she arrived in the mid fifties where the Al Grand Show became involved with you know, obviously a lot of monsters here and the performers were the big names and a lot of the performers had relationships either romantic or otherwise. Uh, and she became one of his you know, his girls. Uh, she was arrested in Texas for marijuana possession and uh, served three years during which she started writing poetry and she ended up publishing a book of her poem. Uh, but she also uh, became close to Jack Ruby uh, after she was cold and she had to stay in Texas uh, because of her parole. Uh, and in the 50s, uh, late 50s, she taught Joe Collins how to dance, uh, as a, play a role as a stripper in the movie Sound of Thieves. Um, uh, Jenny Lee, the bassoon girl. Uh, was uh, in residence at the San Susi for a while. Um, Jenny is important to us because she was the founder of the Exotic Dancers League uh, and later started the collection that is our collection today. Uh, she had the idea for a burlesque hall of fame in 1965 uh, and asked the performers that worked with the Exotic Dancers League, which is a union representing the, the needs of, of Exotic Dancers, uh, part of the American Guild of Variety Artists. Uh, she said, hey, at our annual meeting this year, everyone bring your photos and memorabilia and let's start at the Les Hall of Fame. And that became the core of our collection uh, in the, she displayed it in her bar uh, in San Pedro for uh, a while through the 70s, uh, and then in the 80s purchased a ranch in Helendale, California, which became the Jenny Lee's Exotic World Museum, um, which, <coughs> excuse me, became, uh, the sort of pilgrimage site for the generation of uh, burlesque, of young burlesque performers who brought the art back in the burlesque revival of the 90s uh, and early uh, 2000s. She also, uh, as one of her tag lines said, she was the girl with the really big eyes. <laughs> uh, Liz Renee was um, another one of uh, Mickey Cohen's girls uh, was probably the, the primary of Mickey Cohen's girls. She had sort of wanted to be a Hollywood star um, and she was arrested. She was given parole after perjuring herself during uh, Mickey Cohen's tax evasion trial. Uh, and then she violated the parole and ended up serving time. Uh, for that, and uh, at the end of the 50s, and that basically wrecked her clean, wholesome image for for Hollywood. Um, and so she became, uh, I'm sorry, uh, she became a burlesque dancer, and uh, eventually she became a writer, and eventually wrote several books. Um, my first 2,000 Men, um, uh, How to Attract Men. Um, and, uh, and then in the 70s, she was in the uh, John Waters film, Desperate Living, which gave her sort of a new um, fan base. Uh, gave her a new notoriety uh, and, and sort of revitalized her image. Uh, she also, uh, in the 70s, was doing a mother-daughter act, one of the, probably only, but at least the first uh, mother-daughter act in the last world. 
Of course, the December storm. I'm going to let uh, Tempest talk a little bit about herself later. Uh, this is a picture with uh, the producer Maynard Slow, uh, who was at the Tropicana uh, for many years. Um, here's, so this is the 50s. Here's Tempest with his hair in the 70s. Um, Frederick Apro is a producer. Uh, so we talked about the Minsky's, uh, or Harold Minsky, Frederick Apcar was one of the other burlesque producers. Uh, he did several shows at Casino de Paris, uh, which was of the, the dudes. He did Vive Lace Girls, which ran forever. Um, and what he brought to it, he was a uh, show, uh, you know, he was a dancer in uh, Follies Berger in Paris, uh, and brought this very sort of Parisian show style to the, the Las Vegas uh, strip, <coughs> excuse me, Las Vegas showroom shows. And that, you know, was sort of the next step towards what would become, uh, over time, what we see is uh, shows that have a lot of burlesque in them to shows that have less burlesque in, in them to the big production shows that we're more familiar to, with today. Um, so, I wanted to represent him, uh, Barry Ashton's uh, Wonderful World of Burlesque and the Silver Slipper. Uh, so, we're moving from the 60s into the 70s. Uh, the Silver Slipper also hosted uh, uh, Minsky's Follies. Um, and then here's Minsky's Follies at the Aladdin, I believe this was in 1972. Um, so as we move into the 70s, uh, burlesque is moving off of the big stages into the showrooms uh, and also into uh, smaller nightclubs, uh, the Palomino, uh, the, I always forget the name of it, it's right across the street from my house, the Satin Saddle. It's not called the Satin Saddle anymore, it's called Chicas Bonitas. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, here's some of the other performers, and a lot of these performers still live here in town, uh, a lot of them retired here. Dusty Summers uh, performs nightly in Vegas Nocturne at the uh, Rose Rabbit Live at the Cosmopolitan. Um, she is the, uh, you could say she's the headline, <laughs> she's the very last act of the night. Um, and if you've seen that show, uh, it's pretty amazing to see an audience full of young club kids who go absolutely wild. Uh, and a performer who's been performing here for, gosh, 40 years. Uh, comes out with that sort of thing. Um, Dusty also wrote uh, entertainment columns here in the 70s. Uh, Gina Bonbon, uh, did I put some notes here? She was, um, oh, and Dusty was also the first female pit boss here in town. <laughs> uh, Gina Bonbon performed at the Cabaret. Kid Natividad performed at, this is what I was looking at to refresh my memory, performed at Sat Saddle. Uh, Kitten was uh, the uh, in a couple of Russ Meyer's movies um, and became his partner uh, for the last 15 years of his life. Uh, Delilah Jones, uh, Marika, these were some of the performers. Marika was um, one of the dancers in All That Jazz. Uh, Satan's Angel, The Devil's Own <laughs> Mistress. Uh, also, and I think I have some notes here. Uh, she was uh, performed the Minsky's Burlesque and Wonderful World of Burlesque and later the Palomino. So that brings us up until the, the 70s, late 70s and early 80s, when burlesque, by which time burlesque had really fallen out of the mainstream and had been replaced by strip clubs, go-go clubs, topless clubs, uh, pornography. Um, after the 70s, when, when you know, triple X movies were playing them, on big screens uh, in every city, it became a little quaint. Uh, actually, when you go to the beach and see someone in you know, four square inches of a bikini, it became a little quaint to go to a show to see someone just down in cases in a G-string. And, uh, and burlesque, although there's a couple of strains of it that, that last, the burlesque kind of um, faded from the mainstream until the 90s. Uh, and as I said, until Exotic World, um, until some of these movies that featured um, uh, people like Tempest came uh, back on VHS, uh, the Irving Claw films, uh, varieties of Stripperama, um, and the kind of uh, 
second generation uh, after feminism, the, the daughters of the 70s feminists and the daughters of the, the young women who had grown up with you know, sort of feminism in the atmosphere, looking for ways to be, you know, to assert themselves in society without necessarily being the big shoulder pads and the, you know, uh, power feminists of the, of the 80s. And, uh, and Latch on to Burlesque um, came out to the Burlesque, uh, sorry, came out to Exotic World, uh, where they met uh, some of the legends of, of the 50s and 60s and learned from them. Uh, and so in the aughts, basically, in the early 2000s, uh, Burlesque started to be a thing here in Las Vegas again. Uh, as now more of a do-it-yourself art form uh, produced by performers and not by big time producers. Um, uh, acts designed by the performers themselves, you know, but less today is a very different shape than it did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, we uh, moved out here, we moved our show, we have an annual show every uh, summer, the first summer, I'm uh, sorry, the first weekend in June every year where we have the Miss Exotic World pageant which started in 1991 now in the desert. Um, we have a night where Legends of Burlesque perform uh, on Friday, Friday night of that event, first Friday in June. Um, we, we have all a show that's composed entirely of Legends of Burlesque from 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and uh, so we came out here in 2006 with our show. Um, here's Kalani Kalani one. Uh, Miss Exotic World in 2009, which is the, the big crown, the reigning queen of burlesque. Um, uh, we are now at the Orleans, we've been at the Orleans since 2011. Uh, our museum opened in 2010, uh, in the UC Tempest. Uh, you see Dixie Evans, who ran the museum from 1991 until the late 2000s, uh, passed away last year. Uh, we opened in 2010, which was the very last day of Kalani's reign as the reigning <laughs> princess. Uh, Holly Madison is next to her. Behind them is Dirty Martini, which is the former Miss Exotic World. Andrew Ponhani, a former Miss Exotic World. Uh, and then April March, Holly O'Hara, uh, some of our other legends. Um, and today, uh, Chacho, as I said, runs the Las Vegas Burlesque Studio. Uh, Tiffany, uh, you can see this picture, Tiffany is teaching or taking a class, I don't know, um, but uh, taking a class, uh, in, in a class there, um, and also does live burlesque in Las Vegas, uh, which, when the museum opened, there weren't really any monthly shows, there weren't really any regular shows, there was just uh, some shows here and there that were put together, sort of one off, um, and I just started live burlesque in Las Vegas, started a monthly show at Bloomers, the first Saturday every month. Today there's a show every Saturday of the month, uh, as well as some Sundays and Mondays, uh, as well as uh, one Thursday of the month. And so we have uh, seen in the last four, five years, a huge explosion. Um, Connie performs at the Treasures Comedy Club um, regularly. Uh, we have Absinthe, which features, actually, I go back, this is, um, Julia Alexander is here with the big balloon. Um, she was in Absinthe when it was in New York and developed the balloon act based on that by Sally Rand. Um, and uh, so Ad that's one of the, the acts that's in Absinthe uh, today. I already mentioned Vegas Nocturne. Um, some of you may have seen an article on Zombie Burlesque uh, last week in the weekly. So Burlesque is sort of coming back and thriving here in Las Vegas. Um, so I want to introduce our panel tonight. Uh, we have Tempest Storm, uh, who started performing here in the 1950s and uh, performed here until like four years ago. Uh, <laughs> Tiffany Carter. in the 70s not performed here in Las Vegas, but knew a lot of the performers here and came here very often to see them, uh, and uh, retired here and has been performing here in the last, since we moved out here, uh, about six times on our stage, uh, as well as in Chacha's show, as well as teaching classes, um, so has had a real resurgence of her career in Las Vegas in the last few years. 
our climate coconuts. As I This is out of Portland in 2009. I uh, perform here regularly, uh, uh, weekly, right? Right? Cha Cha Valour. Kept this with her home dollar pound. Um, <laughs> uh, the producer of Live Girl Ask in Las Vegas, uh, which is the monthly show I just mentioned, uh, and the headmistress of the Las Vegas Burles studio, um, and Hop Couture. One, uh, one of Chacha's students uh, has begun uh, performing and producing in the last year and a half, I guess. Um, so we essentially have <coughs> the entire sweep of Las Vegas history, uh, burlesque history here on stage. Um, and I'm going to ask him a few questions, and then, like I said, we will move on and you guys can ask your own questions. Uh, so, Tempest, I'm going to start with you. I'm actually going to sit down for this part now that I don't have to see the screen anymore. <laughs> Um, so, Tempest, uh, I, I want to start by just asking each of you, actually, uh, how did you get into burlesque, how did you discover it, and, and become a performer? Well, that'll take, that'll take about a year to do that. <laughs> I started in the chorus line in Los Angeles in 1951, and I got a lot of publicity with Dean Martin and Jimmy Lewis called the Mickey Awards. The news media thought the Academy Awards were getting kind of stuffy, so they thought up this Mickey Awards. And one act, I think it was Phil Harris, uh, got a Mickey Award for having, making the most phone calls from the famous Brown Derby. And I got a Mickey Award for having the biggest props in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I was on my way, and Lillian Hunt had taught me. She was the producer of the Follies and she was getting rid of all the professional dancers and bringing in all young girls. And I did a lot, a lot of publicity in LA and the news media really loved me there. And I went up to the LA as a headliner and I was on my way after that and I traveled back east and all over the world. And I did a, a tour with the James Gang, the rock group in 1973. I worked at Carnegie Hall, I worked in London, and Vegas, I was, I guess it was 51. The first nightclub I worked was in North Las Vegas called the Embassy. They only, had, they only had three hotels here. The El Rancho, the Desert Inn, and the, the uh, I forget, I remember the other one. But then I came back to Mitzke's, starring in the Mitzke Review in 1957. And I've, Worked here many times, and I worked in Reno, the Hilton, and all, I've traveled all over the world, and I'm very proud of what I did. And I never drank, I never smoked, and I never did drugs. And I, <laughs> and I, I, I watched uh, my diet I have a birth certificate. I, because I didn't want to ever get heavy. People accuse me, oh, she must have weighed 165 when she first started. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I live in Las Vegas now, and I'm getting ready to go on a tour, make appearances. One in Kansas City. The last time I was there, I made an appearance with Walter Cronkite. <laughs> that was legit. <laughs> they, had redone the Folly Theater, which used to be a burlesque theater, and they had a legit show opening with a couple of actors, and of course, well, Walter was from Kansas City, so we were the host and the host, and it was great. I have great memories, and I'm, I'm still dropping my veils, and I will not give up. <laughs> around a long time and I'm going to be a long time before I leave here because the man upstairs doesn't want me. The devil gave up on me a long time ago so I got no place to go. <laughs> uh, so Tiffany, you want to tell us uh, how you got to ask a little bit about your career? What? 
Uh, how did you get into burlesque and a little bit about your career? Um, I started dancing as a little girl. I took a lot of classes, tap, ballet, jazz, so I never had any doubt in my mind that I wanted to be a dancer somewhere, someday, and on stage. Um, so in the late 60s, I snuck out and did a go-go dancing for a little bit until my husband caught me. <laughs> so I managed that for a little while, but I never forgot the dream of wanting to be on a stage or dance somewhere. So uh, I found out here in Las Vegas I wanted to be a showgirl for a long time, and I could not be a showgirl because I was too short. You had to be 5'8 and a flat feet, and at those times, they still do it for Jubilee show here today. I was not tall on that. So I still pursued a career of dancing. I went to an agent at that time in the late 60s, early 70s. They were starting topless already. And I was scared to death that my mother backed me. She went with me to audition for a topless club in Long Beach, California. I went to an agent, and I got the job. And the agent, at the time, gave me my name, Tiffany. I was playing Pussycat in Hollywood, California. And I took off from there. Around 73, I started touring, and I knew Kit Natividad. She lived in Hollywood, and I found out who her agent was, and I uh, hit the road. And in 1975, I, she crowned me Miss New Universe. She was the two years previous. So that instantly made me a headliner, and I worked all over the United States, Canada, and toured in Japan as well. Um, well, I started my burlesque career actually as a stripper in, uh, at underage in a club in Anchorage, Alaska, and mostly because I needed the money. And um, I saw my first feature entertainer, and at that time a feature entertainer was a uh, person who either had uh, foreign credits or centerfold credits, and they would travel around the U.S or the world and feature in a club all week and do shows. And they, a lot of them had these uh, amazing elaborate costumes. So as a regular floor stripper, I saw my first feature entertainer. And after that, I was just smitten with performing and I started making my own costumes. And second, I turned 21. I had a truck, a little truck, and I packed all my costumes nothing else because only the costumes fit in the back of my truck, <laughs> drove down the Alcan uh, with my mom all the way to California to Nevada and started dancing at the Palomino, like uh, the most of the ladies have performed it. And um, we did all of our shows, four shows a night downstairs, and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, the owner died, Paul Perry, um, Rest his soul, died about a year later, and then I went on the road, on the road as a future entertainer. And with that, um, got married, had a kid, and decided that I really, really missed burlesque and still had a lot of my costumes, and just kind of got back into it. And I was fortunate enough to have been able to perform at the original Miss Exotic World, the Go Farm, um, out in the desert. And that was pretty much the last year that it was there before the museum moved here to Las Vegas. And I'm just grateful and so happy that I've been able to actually have a career in burlesque. And then I, I'm so happy that there's been a resurgence and an interest. And it's wonderful to see all of you here. So that's how I got my start. Um, so I got my start. Um, there was an ad on MySpace when people still use MySpace. <laughs> um, I was I just moved to Las Vegas. Um, I'm uh, actually what I do for my day job is I'm a registered nurse, and um, I work for an agency that was sending me around the country, and I was filling in for um, hospitals that needed some extra staff. So I came here on a travel contract, and I started playing Wilbur Derby, got injured, and was looking for something to do. And so then on MySpace, a little ad came up that there was a local burlesque troupe looking for auditions. And I went to the audition, and they took me in. 
Um, and this was the early-ish 2000s. Um, and that sort of started. It started as a hobby, just something fun to do with some girlfriends. And then over the last bunch of years, it's become a lot more of a hobby. Um, really become almost a profession for me. Um, so yeah, thank you, MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> I also met my husband on MySpace. started as a hobby, um, and then, you know, the little group I was with, um, I started being more aware that burlesque was happening outside of Las Vegas, and I met people in other cities, and I would go perform in other cities, and there's this whole um, thing that exists called the burlesque festival circuit, there's shows you apply to, and if you get in, you, you can go perform, sometimes they're competitions, sometimes they're not. Um, so I was getting into festivals, I was going, I won a couple things here and there, sort of got a name for myself within the newer, newer burlesque. Um, and the rest of the girls in the troupe didn't really have the same vision or direction uh, that I wanted to in burlesque. They were very against um, teaching other people, uh, newer girls, how to perform, or encouraging other troops to start up. They were, they, they were very much a, sort of a ne negative first experience for me. Um, and I was in this vision, well, like, there should just be this ginormous burlesque world in Las Vegas of, of all these women and men. Um, so as that truth uh, dissipated, I decided I wanted to start teaching, I wanted to start a show, and I think over you know, the last four or five years, um, our community of burlesque has ginormously grown. Um, and I want to say that it was probably for me, mostly, partly, <laughs> which is kind of cool, from the school. So. Um, and yeah, I'm still evolving. <laughs> I came into burlesque, uh, to know burlesque as a fan, and uh, was browsing on the internet one day and came across, um, I was just trying to immerse myself in anything burlesque at that time and came across an ad for Las Vegas burlesque classes, and I thought, that might be fun. So I signed up and started um, a one-on-one -on -one with Chacha, um, who took me under her wing, and she's affectionately known um, to the starlets, the newer the newer um, ones of us in burlesque as Mother Hen, and um, just started um, just com taking classes and performing actively ever since. So, uh, Tempest uh, and, and Tiffany, I want to ask you both, uh, what was what was burlesque like for you? You know, the first time you saw the show. Um, well, I had a production incident. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, choreographed me. I had two male dancers in the act with me. And Ralph Earl, who was a columnist, very famous, and he said, by a small margin, I barely keep from making the land room at the tombs a garage. Uh, <laughs> it was a little risky, but very classy. I always made it. You know, but in, in those days, it was absolutely wonderful. Everybody dressed. Now we got the jean brigade going through here now. <laughs> anyway, it was wonderful. And as I said, I worked that small nightclub, so I saw Las Vegas grow up. There was only three hotels. And then I worked the Densi, uh, the Densi, uh, Minskis, and also the Aladdin, moved over to the Aladdin before he left Vegas. And it was wonderful, absolutely great. Production numbers, beautiful. Audience, fabulous. And I imagine with so many entertainers here, uh, there must have been, the audiences must have been just a who's who of, of different people, right? You're right, you're absolutely right. The audiences were unbelievable. And the, a lot of the movie stars used to come here to see the burlesque show. And Sally Rand was here, Lily was here, and I was here. <laughs> so it was, it was wonderful, and I really miss it. So it's a little bit different today. So, but I always did a class act. I never did anything vulgar. Little Saint there was absolutely, she's the first one that I saw in burlesque. And I thought she was classy, and I thought if I could 
we class her like that, I'll go into the business. So she was a great friend also. She was kind of upset about me in the beginning. Somebody, some a girl was taking off her costume and she, instead of staff, she had pins and she was dropping them on the stage instead of throwing them in the wings. And Lily was doing a barefoot number and she was stepping on them. And, and I got accused of it. I said, I beg your pardon, I have snaps or hooks on my costumes. But, but that, but Lily didn't like me for some reason in those days. Well, she's doing this. Well, she's doing her arms the way I'm going, you know. So I became angry and I said to Lily, I said, get me the hell out of here and send me someplace else because I don't like that woman. <laughs> <laughs> so she sent me up to the Al Wright Theater. And, uh, but before I left, they brought Lily and she followed me in. And uh, so I went backstage and I thought, well, she may want not talk to me. But anyway, she says, I took me. She says, I knew you were going to be a big star when I met you. I said, is that why you bitched about me all the time? <laughs> well, and, and we became great friends before she passed away. She was an angel, absolutely terrific. And at Tempest, you started uh, coming out here in the late 60s and early 70s. And what, what was it like and how it changed from? What was it? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Did I say that? Is it? I, I'm sorry. I'm when I started uh, in the late 60s, there was topless going on, of course, and then in the early 70s, a lot of places started going totally new, so things changed drastically. Of course, the late 60s, a lot of eras got changed also to the, the stylists. We were wearing more pants outfits instead of just straight gowns, so our styles changed. We did. We changed up and did a lot of different type of shows. I was fortunate to become a member of one of the show we did on Losers, in Los Angeles, where I still have big friends today that are, are going to perform for us. Not thank goodness. Anyway, they, we did a pattern after the Crazy Horse Saloon Paris show, and so it was the first time I got to perform with group and duo members, as well as we had our individual acts. And from there is when I left and hit the road. Um, because in total nudity started, Los, An Los Angeles area, some days you would have alcohol and some days you wouldn't. It depended on the law, what side of the street you were on and what was changing. So things were changing a lot, you know. The, the movie stars though came in to the Pink Pussycat and the Losers as well. We used to see Johnny Carson and his writers a lot, Bob Holt, Glenn Ford, I could go on and on, and people I waited on as well as a cocktail waitress though. So we saw and met a lot of great people in the Hollywood area then. So by the time I hit the road, of course, everything was pretty much totally nude. Now there were some different laws in different parts of the United States you traveled. So when I got to some of these places, a couple of places, I had to put on pasties. And I had never heard or seen a pasty in my life. I was like, what are these things? And I remember having to put these things out and go along, and that was very uncomfortable for me. And pulling it off was the worst thing I've thought. <laughs> So I never did become what's popular today. They brought back the pasties and the tassel twirling and all that is very popular today. But in my era, we didn't do that. And so I wore pasties only a couple of times. And then um, when the Miss New Universe that I won pageant was to in Toronto, Canada, because they were banned in Boston and other places because of being totally nude. So they had to find a place to put on that pageant. So things changed drastically from, I was fortunate enough to still be on the road when Tempest and Blaze Star and people like that were still performing before everything changed so much. So I got to see Blaze Star at one point when I was working in Detroit and left the theater I worked in, in between to see her show. I followed Tempest many, many places, but I actually never really got to meet her until I came to Las Vegas for the first year in 2006. So things had changed drastically, and it went on from there. And, and um, of course, back in that era, uh, when I left the business in the late 80s, things were changing even more. But at that time, we couldn't hire anyone. Like today, uh, they have tattoos or different things on their bodies, but those days we couldn't even hire anyone like that. 
Back in our day, you had to have that perfect body. Today, a lot of that has changed. And that's a good thing, I think, for a lot of the girls. It gives us more opportunity and other people to see everyone is beautiful in one way or another. And so for these girls that be able to perform, it gives them confidence in their life. And it's changed for the better as far as I'm concerned when it comes to that. So, it's, it's gone on to new for that, which they'll explain to you more about. But the music changed, the styles of clothing changed, and a lot of our acts changed a lot from there to our. For instance, I did a cat act. I did a Raggedy Ann doll, uh, like a puppet that came to life. I did a bathtub act. I did a kind of a Jean Harlow type act. And right before I left the business, I was putting together a show for a um, saloon girl. So we did several different types of shows, and I would do different shows depending on what my audience was like and how big the crowd was in the evening, depending on what place I was working. And um, I was one of the first ones to come out with some lighting on my costume when I was a cat. Remember I did, I had some lights put on my fingers and a really good friend of mine that was an engineer designed these special gloves for me with vitamin dials on my fingers and I had a switch here to switch off and on like claws on my hands. So in that years they didn't see many lights or anything like that so that was a big talk about part of my show at the time and my cat show. So I brought it back a couple of years ago and decided to light up my whiskers this time instead. <laughs> <laughs> so from there, it changed a lot. And then when I left the business, of course, in the late 80s, I was running a nightclub in Los Angeles. It was starting to become the private dancing and the pole dancing thing, <coughs> which wasn't anything we did at all. So it really changed after that. Uh, Claudia, I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. Uh, when you came <coughs> down here uh, in the 90s, there wasn't really any any sort of relaxed. There was, you um, talked about the feature dance school. So, what, what were your inspirations and how did you sort of discover that community? Well, actually, at the time when I had when I had first come to Las Vegas, I was sort of at the tail end of technically what was still burlesque. And it's quite an interesting progression here because in the 90s um, we did smoke and drink and do mm -hmm. drugs and we were totally nude. So, but um, we were very, very covered on stage and there was kind of no, was a handful of us that were sort of still around and didn't know where to be. I think um, some of us just went into feature entertaining. And we just kind of either hibernated for a little while till uh, the resurgence sort of came back. <coughs> and um, it was a, I don't know, it was just kind of like a, maybe a dark time for burlesque because there really, it wasn't, it really, it had died, I would say, at that time. But then just give it, I would say maybe four or five years later, it sort of um, had a new revival. So, coming out of feature entertaining, it was really, really nice to not have to be nude anymore and go into burlesque and be able to perform a real show because what you understand is when you're um, in a, a gentleman's club, they don't really want to watch you for 25 minutes take your bra off. So <laughs> no one has the patience for that because um, they just don't. So um, it was a really, really nice to be able to be creative again and to be able to do something with the people again. So that's how it was. Um, and Chacha, when you, uh, when MySpace opened the Golden Vista for you, um, and, you, and you did look around and saw, like, who were the people that you turned to, um, and how did you sort of find out what to do and, and sort of where to go with burlesque to? You know, to develop the, the so, so at first, I mean, we didn't, what I was working on and, and the woman I was working with, we didn't really, really have anyone specifically. It was just like, figure it out as we go along, and I've heard this, or I've heard this, and, um, and then even going to other cities. Um, and then I really started to learn when I went to some of these festivals and to see so many other performers, uh, to go to the Weekender and see Legends and be able to take classes from Legends and also from peer performers. 
Um, and that's when, when things started to change, is when I specifically learned from other performers outside of Las Vegas or outside of my um, age peer group as well. Um, okay, and a really question for you is, um, you know, you came into a scene that was already sort of established and growing. Um, what is what is it like now to, to be a performer here, to, you know, to, have, to do these shows and to, to be part of this community? Yeah, it's pretty, it really feels fantastic to um, be able to get up on stage um, with all my flaws and the body I have now. Um, I began the lesson when I was 37, so it's, I didn't come into it as, you know, somebody, as a, a young performer just coming out to Las Vegas to be a showgirl. It gave me a chance to, to be creative. Um, like Kalani, and um, to work at, I got a job at um, the Burlesque Hall of Fame Museum where I got to talk about legends every day in the exotic world and pioneers like Cha Cha. And it's just, it's, it's an amazing feeling to feel that um, you're kind of on the breaking point of this, you know, even though the resurgence has been back for a while, that, you know, you're kind of a part of pushing it forward. And um, so it's it's great to be able to perform and to be able to perform freely and to be creative and to have a creative outlet and to feel good about myself as a woman and feel empowered. And um, those are that's those are all the things that I got from becoming uh, a performer in your last here in Las Vegas. Okay. Um, and then uh, the, the this will be the last question, and then I'll open up uh, for for everyone. Uh, I want to ask each of you what was your favorite moment in burlesque, whether that's a, a fun story or a, you know, sort of peak moment of your career or, or whatever. And uh, Tempest, I guess we'll start with you. The, uh, <laughs> the famous uh, place that I appeared was Carnegie Hall. That was one of the highlights of my career. And also I toured with a rock group called James Gang. One six weeks, one nighters, and I said to the guys, I said, "How the hell do you do this every night, <laughs> one after the other?" But it was fun, and uh, then we played Carnegie Hall. And that was one of the highlights. And I worked in London, and uh, I've had a great life, and I'm not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> We thought it died in a way. In 2006, I came to Las Vegas with a friend to see what was going on with this mystic thought of world they were bringing into town. And I was amazed to see that it was still alive and that these younger girls were doing the old, beautiful, classic less that we used to do and the beautiful costumes and everything. So, the greatest moment for me, I never thought, I used to dream about it, I never thought of what it would happen or when or where. 2009, I was performing at the Orleans Legends Night for the Lost Call of Fame, and my daughters were there to see me for the first time to see what mom did. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, um, when I uh, won the um, for Lost Call of Fame Miss Exotic World competition in 2009, that was a highlight because. It um, basically reinforced everything that I was doing. But I, I have to say, honestly, the biggest, biggest highlight of my burlesque career is when, I don't know, at the age of 41, after almost 20 years of performing, my mother finally came to see me perform in absinthe <laughs> because she had been really, really upset about my career this whole time. And after that, she just looked at me a little differently and it, and um, it was really, really nice just to have her come to the one and only show that she came to. But yeah, <laughs> I feel bad. Same question. Same question. So um, I don't. I'm not going to say that I have a specific highlight because every year that I've been involved, every year seems to be getting better and better. And something awesome happens, and then the following year, something even more awesome happens. <laughs> so I'm going to say I haven't reached the highlight yet. I feel the same. I feel 
well, I hope I have many highlights um, to come. One of the highlights is just uh, being asked to be here with all these, you know, beautiful people and you know these great people because there's so many wonderful performers in Las Vegas. And if you ever have a chance to come and see a local show, um, please do because these girls are putting and, and gentlemen are putting their their hearts out, you know, and putting all their creativity in. They're a great value, and and, uh, and it's it's a beautiful art, and I'm I'm hoping I have uh, many highlights in my Alex career. So yeah, I guess I I guess we should have thought about having a microphone somewhere, but um, uh, just uh, I guess I'll. But if, if you want to ask a question, I can barely see out. Maybe I'll come over to the edge of the stage. Um, and just, uh, yeah, raise your hand and I'll stand pointing you and you'll yell. <laughs> uh, yes, Kevin, I was wondering that uh, you mentioned twice about who are in Lady James Gang. Now, I know they were singing, not just when we were dancing, and it's just all going on. I had a jail till Monday morning, but I happened to be dating a guy at the time that was a real good friend of the bail bondsman. And they got, <laughs> got me out the next morning. <laughs> So when I went to court, of course, it was kind of locked out of court by the judge. It was dropped to a misdemeanor. But that started a windfall of these vice cops going around to different little areas of local clubs in Los Angeles, getting arrested quite often. So I ended up, because I was dating a black man at the time, who was famous, had a famous brother, who was a Dodger player named Willie Davis. And the judge didn't like when he heard about that. So I was sentenced to 90 days after all my trials and tribulations. When I went to jail, I was put on. And it was very strange to be near them. And I served about 20 to 30 of my 90 days I was sentenced. And I got out and fought it for another year. After another year, I got the same judge and the same problem. And Alice Schiller at the Pink Pussy Cat in Hollywood at that time, I had started working for them. She even tried to help me through this procedure and got an attorney to help me. And I actually got to meet Sybil Brown of Sybil Brown Institute at that time as well. And she wanted to know after all my trials and tribulations and my 90 days that I finished, how I was treated there. So it goes on from that. You better not lock me up because I, my doctor will be on your case because I, I'm, a, I'm a nervous wreck, and you, and you better not lock me up in that cell. And he did, he took care, he took care of me very care of me. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, what do you think? Does the current Burlesque ever incorporate pole dancing? Pole dancing. Is there a between current Burlesque Yes. So there are casual between pole dancing and there are, there are acts that um, that do incorporate pole dancing with stretchies. It might not be the pole dancing thing you see, you know, in some of the senior places, but um, it's um, actually very beautiful. So yes. And I, and I would add the the modern girls and neo burlesque incorporates a lot of sort of circus and sideshow stuff as well. So you have uh, aerial acts mm -hmm. on streamers or on hoops. Um, this, uh, you have a lot of uh, even incorporating magic and stuff like that, which Dusty Summers, who I showed earlier, was a magician, you know, the new magician way back in, in the <laughs> 70s. Um, so there is a lot of pulling into the art of whatever sort of inspirations people, people have. Um, yes? Uh, Jeff is, <clears throat> did you ever have any affiliation? No. Uh, with the mob, or did any of them uh, ask you out, or did they try to control burlesque back in those days? Or I'm sorry you asked that. It'll <laughs> 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 take six months to tell him. <laughs> yes, I uh, mm. met Bugsy Siegel. I was 19. I was working as a car hop in Los Angeles. Simon's driving, and we used to carry the trays out and we were tight fitting slacks and all that to wait on the customers. And I waited on him, and uh, I thought, this is a 
very good looking guy. I didn't know who he was. So he asked me out for a date. And I went out with him. Had a lovely evening. And then the next week he said, well, I'm going to Vegas. And I said, well, it so happens that I'm off tomorrow night. So he made, it, made plans to go to Las Vegas. And I was going with him because I was off the next day. So the boss called me. He says, one of the girls are taken ill and I need you. I said, well, I have plans to go to Vegas. He said, well, either you come in or you're fired. So I couldn't afford to be fired. So I didn't go with him. But anyway, I pick up the paper the next day. He's going away. <laughs> I'm lucky that I didn't. Or maybe he would have been still living if we had gone to Vegas. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, my God, I said, I'm hanging around with a mob. <laughs> and I, I knew quite a few. They were nice people, very nice people. What, what was the safety like for all of you guys like, when you were working? Yeah, so the question is, um, what, what kind of safety measures uh, were in place uh, during your performance events for everyone? <laughs> I've, I've never had an experience that I, I felt unsafe. Um, even getting booked for like a private gig or something. I've, yeah, people are pretty respectful. Now, you know, I've never been in a sketchy situation, I should say. Um, but if, like, sometimes if I get booked to do a private party at someone's house, I'll bring someone with me. I would call it security, but, you know, I'm not going to go alone and strip at someone's house for, you know, no. Yeah, I did several private parties and bachelor, bachelor parties long, uh, back in the 70s as well, but I always took someone with me, never went alone. Actually, I found a lot of the bachelors to be way more bashful than I was. <laughs> <laughs> and what about in the theaters? Because I know, like, Patty Starr talks about how she, she never went anywhere without a brass knuckles. You know, like, did you, were you ever crashed in, in theaters or, or in, you know, was on the way to theaters or, you know, because of what you did? Mm -hmm. We played for ourselves sometimes. Yeah, the places. <laughs> there was a lot of places I worked where there was no bouncers or anything, and I remember one time in a place in Newport, Kentucky, their place was getting kind of rowdy, and I heard a few comments when, when I could hear them. <laughs> and so I just jumped off the stage and had a guy over the head with a beer bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, when the mob ran on stage, it was really great because everybody was classy, everybody dressed, and they were very polite. The mobs that I met, very <coughs> I don't know what they did on the side, but we should have them back. Yeah. <laughs> Our current shows today, we usually know the producers very well, and so they're always you know, very safe. We've never had a problem feeling unsafe. It's usually because we work for actual productions, as it more these days, with the exception of Kalani at the um, Sapphire Comedy Hour. She's with a, a club. It's a, sh it's a show. It's a show. Yeah. Show yeah. Show so show. yeah, we're all, they're all produ produced in theaters for you. Um, so it's not kind of the same as it was. Um, so it's all very safe, very controlled. Things have changed so much today because of technology, of course. Like years back, we worked with agents booked us. We had signed contracts. And uh, we were told where to go, uh, how much we get paid, we you know, even tell us which hotels to stay in and everything else. Of course, today the girls work more, I think, off their websites and Kickstart programs or whatever they do to get um, bookings. Best. So that's changed a lot too because of, of the technology and differences. And also in the ways we do, do music, of course. Today it's all. Uh, you know, MP3 players and everything they learn. I don't even know how to run one. <laughs> CDs were popular when I was working. I danced to live bands vaguely once in a great while. So our music styles changed a lot between our eras, too. When I worked with this, because they had a 14 piece band. <laughs> yes, the last time I worked on 14 piece. Um, you know, even within America, the style of burlesque, I think, um, changes even regional, like what is kind of going on in New York is different than what's going on in Seattle, which is different than going on in Vegas, which is different than going on in, in um, 
LA. Um, I really see the differences there because I know the most uh, performers from the States. Um, and even up in Canada, what's going on in Vancouver compared to what's going on in Toronto is very different. Um, so I don't know if it's so much country specific. Um, I, people I know from Europe, um, I see all kinds of styles that come out of there, all kinds of styles that come out of Australia. So I'm sure it's the same. Uh, Tiffany, she asked uh, about you traveling to Japan. Well, that when you were in Japan. What about it? You want to see There was a lot of hostesses that worked from all over the world who worked these clubs. And um, I was only there for a month because that's a long story. I, I was married to a J Japanese for a very short time. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> can't take these kids anywhere. Uh, are you good? Are you good? Are you good? Did you change your act when you were in Japan, or was the audience really for whatever oh, you were yeah, doing? Yeah, they had to. They had the variety shows there. They would have a, a bit of a showgirl type thing, more or less. And just, you had to calm down because those years in Japan, even the Playboy magazines, they had the, the, the bottoms and tops covered. They weren't allowed to see that in their magazines, even. So, yeah, it was way different from. And you couldn't take a, a top or anything. So you just basically performed and danced, and then they would have a singer. They would have a singer and like a variety show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's a question up here, and then in the back, and then uh, you're in front of her. Are we going to see an example of uh, some of the dance tonight? <laughs> uh, I don't think we're going to see an example of some of the dance tonight, but I will tell you where you can see all these performers uh, the, uh, before you leave. Yes? To Tiffany and Tempest, do you recall when burlesque hit the U.S. and what your reaction was? Were you already stripping? When, when burlesque hit U.S.? Well, it's my understanding burlesque came from the U.K. to U.S., so I, I have to... Yeah, it was quite a bit earlier by the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm referring to when they were alive. 1860. <laughs> so what was, what was their reaction when burlesque started, like, turning stripping different? So uh, the question is, what was your reaction as burlesque started turning into stripping and, and started changing into the gentleman's clubs? Did you take everything off? Yeah. I thought it was a bad, bad thing. <laughs> um, I was wearing two dress clothes when I played London. <laughs> and the owner came back and he says, uh, the lights are very low. He says, could you take off that last G Street? I said, we don't do this sort of thing in America. <laughs> and when I got back from that engagement, four months, the first thing they were doing here, taking everything off. <laughs> Which I, I, I never resorted to that because that's not classy. You <laughs> leave some to the imagination. I felt uh, totally, totally new that way. So I used to wear a waist chain or some little thing to a little trinket that I would. Or after going totally new, absolutely put a negligee on and camouflage on spend in a negligee or something like that. But of course when you're doing a back to back, you get totally new, you just play around with bubbles and stuff in the bathtub as well. And then of course I would get out and actually dry myself off and play around with the towel around. So it would depend what show you were doing. I played with the feathers.
stripping or something like that? Why is it still burlesque? The intention of the performer. So uh, in a strip club, um, in a your intention is sexual gratification to your um, audience member. It's more like a service. Um, in burlesque, I, I'm not. I you know I, I don't want someone. You know, someone might get a hard on in the audience, but that's not my goal. My goal is more to be entertaining and maybe be. Um, Sex is definitely involved, but more to make fun of sex or to be cheeky about it. Um, but that's a, the way burlesque sort of always has been. It's never been over sexualized. Um, you know, the, the term itself means to make fun of or be a, a, a exaggerated character of. Um, so yeah, um, I think that strip club stripping is absolutely fine. I, there's a whole debate within the the new neo burlesque as people say, "Well, I'm not a stripper." And um, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I think when people do say that, it's disrespectful to burlesque that came before us because it's not like there was burlesque and strip clubs, you know, back <laughs> in the day. Um, yeah. um, so we'll take maybe th three or four more, I think. And uh, so there and there and uh, here and here. Uh, I'm curious because uh, of the El Natural to the silicone. Uh, see, what, what are you curious about exactly? <laughs> <laughs> I'm about something good. Like, so. <laughs> when the Tempest started, it was all the uh, majority of women. Uh, they didn't have uh, silicone in those days. Uh, you had gotten on the. Uh, when you were in LA, they just started where you were working, and then I it, the projection of it is when did it when did the silicone start into the business? So the question is when did silicone plastic surgery start becoming a factor, and how did that sort of affect for last and and performing? I have no idea because I think that augmentation that first started in the late 50s, early 60s, but there are some people who say that um, autop of uh, Marilyn Monroe's autopsy reports that she actually did have silicone implants. So I, I don't know. I'm going to say given about that time, late 50s, early 60s. The, the, you know, as a matter of preference, some people in those days would rather have than that. I guess my question is, is there more preference for the silicone, or is there more preference for the for the natural? Well, if having you know as as a performer, yeah, it would be great if I looked like in the store, but not all of us do. So they went and um, got. Uh, that's true. Yes, and the era, of course, when I started too, it totally topless. Of course, if the bigger boobs, the better, of course. So a lot of us did things to our breasts that were crazy, and um, I went through a lot of problems with what I did to mine, it's a long story, but not today I'm naturally what I have is me and so is everything else parts of me. <laughs> but um, there are people, yes, that went way too far with it and they went through a lot of tragedies and there's girls, girls that I even know that some in the past, the past died from it. So it depends, but yeah, it was being done way back then. I'm, uh, I'm sure, you know, um, the question is directed toward uh, Tempest and Tiffany. When you were performing, did you feel that you were paid um, the way you should be paid for your talent and hard work, or did you have to fight for that, for a good, consistent salary, and has that changed in any way today? So did you feel that you were paid well according to your work, uh, or did you have to fight to be paid well? Um, did you feel like you were paid well? To get paid well? That you were being paid well for, for the work that you did. Um, and then the second part is for, for you guys, do you feel okay. that, I how do you feel that's changed? Pay-wise? Yeah. I got started off on a certain salary. Like I say, I went through an agent, uh, Kitten and Tim and Dad introduced me to her agent, so he only booked certain parts of the, the United States. But um, I had a contract sign, and then of course, when you want a title like a Mr. Universe that I did, um, it, it doubled my salary, and, and of course, it got me a lot more bookings, and, and my salary went way up. Um, 
In fact, I hardly got a chance to go home at that time. So, yeah, it, 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 it depends on how popular you were, how you were received, of course, in these clubs, and you were different clubs and theaters, depending on where you went. So it was all by contract, and of course the agents took a certain percent at the time. And I can't remember exactly what their percentage was, actually. I don't have any old contracts on me, so. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we were protected that way. At least we had contracts signed, and, and they would find out, because if, if I didn't like something or something happened in particular, my agent was very good about not sending any of these other girls up. He would take take my word for it. For instance, in one place I went, we used to do a lot of clubs too at the time where they called bee drinks, where you you sat with customers and you got extra money uh, for drinking. Of course, to fake drinking, it was a whole another world for me to learn, of course. And so, some of those places were really rough to work. It wasn't easy to do that lifestyle for some girls. And um, there was one in particular where a woman who was trying to sit me with people she wanted me to sit with and order my drinks as well. And she had two features in a small little club. Anyway, I, I just had to tell my agent I couldn't take it. That was the only job I ever left, though, of all the places I worked. I usually got along and was okay, but this place I went booked for two weeks. I did my first week and told my agent to get the heck out of it. And he did with no problem, so we were protected by that way too. That's a whole crazy discussion. <laughs> um, within the new burlesque, that's actually a topic of um, lots of debate and um, lots of controversy. Um, all I'm going to say is, if I don't like what they're going to pay me, I don't, I don't do the gig. I've made that decision. But there are a lot of performers that are performing for free because they just want to do it, and it's. Um, I want to say as an audience member and as a producer, you get what you pay for.